welcome everyone, both those in the room and those on Zoom. Thank you so much for being here today. On behalf of myself, I'm Renata, CASI student leader, and the rest of the CASI team. We're so glad you've joined us. The Corporations and Society Initiative, or CASI, engages on issues at the intersection of business, government, and society. We aim to promote effective governance where those with power are properly accountable for their impact on others. Today, we're here to have a conversation about the more personal side of power. What power means, whether we have any right to pursue it, and how to use it for good. And we have no better set of people to discuss this with. Linda Ginzel, on the far left, is visiting us from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, where she's been faculty since 1992, and recently was voted as the faculty... <laughs> Yay. A popular woman. <laughs> um, and she was recently voted as a faculty member who best demonstrates excellence in teaching at Booth. A huge honor. She specializes in negotiation skills, managerial psychology, leadership, and executive development. Her recent book, Choosing Leadership, which some of you have already picked up, which is great to see, helps readers to develop what she terms leadership capital, the courage, wisdom, and capacity to decide when to manage and when to lead. She's also the founder of Kids in Danger, or KID, a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting children by fighting for product safety, which she started with her husband after the tragic death of their young son, Danny, in 1998. Linda will be joined by Anat Admadi, GSB professor of finance and economics and CASI faculty director, and someone who fearlessly speaks truth to power. The conversation will be moderated by Jeff Pfeffer, creator of the iconic GSB course, Paths to Power, and author of the book, Power, Why Some People Have It and Some Don't. Thanks to all of you who submitted questions. We've tried to incorporate that in the panel discussion today. Um, we'll take about 35 minutes of the panel and then open it up for audience Q&A from all of you and from Zoom, Amira, another CASI student leader is managing the Zoom, so we'll make sure to get those questions answered as well. Um, now join me in welcoming the panel. I'll pass it off to them. Thank you. So Anad, I believe, started the Corporations and Society Initiative, which is designed to explore the broader, if you will, non-economic effects of companies on society and to how to create organizations, and for that matter, societies, that benefit social well-being. Although I'm probably best known for my class on power, I also wrote a book called Dying for a Paycheck, uh, which is probably closer uh, to the theme of corporations and society, which talks about the effects of workplaces on human health. My two colleagues have worked mightily over the years on this project of how to create societies that benefit and organizations that benefit people. And I want to begin by asking each of them, first with Linda and then with Anat, what they have learned, um, what they have learned from their experience with this. Uh, as Renata said, Linda Ginzel started Kids in Danger um, after her young infant son, Danny, uh, died in a crib accident. Um, the crib, by the way, had been recalled at the time, but because of uh, how toy and, and uh, ch children furniture manufacturers operate, actually recall products are not always known to have been recalled. Uh, Danny's death was followed approximately a month later by the death of another child in New Jersey from the identical crib. And I believe, and you should correct me if I'm wrong, his death was preceded by, 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 by the death of other, of, of other children, of, of, of other children from the from the from the same product. So, Kids in Danger is a very very personal as well as a, as well as an impactful uh, organization, and it was founded to make sense of and try to make sure that not too many other children suffered and families suffered the same fate as hers. What have you learned about dealing? and building organizations and dealing with organizations, including the toy manufacturers and the children furniture manufacturers over the years that you've run this organization? My goodness, I was not expecting an abstract high-level question like that to start with. So while I, while I stall for time to give you a succinct, pithy 
answer, I have to say something very quickly. Okay, so my first job was at Stanford. I was an assistant professor here in 1989, and the first people, I, the first person I met was Anad and her husband, and then Jeff Effer. This is actually on the way to my answer to this question. So, <laughs> so um, my husband is also a psychologist, a professor, and six months after I took the job here, he got a job at the University of Chicago. We made, and un, this is part of my answer, I think. What are your choices? What are your priorities? How do you think about your identity and your life? And this is one of the things that I think I've learned in my struggle to, um, to fight uh, a good fight for now 26 years, probably. Um, so when, when he got this job and we had agreed that we would not commute, that we wanted to be together and that we weren't going to commute, I went to Jeff. And I said, you know, Jeff, um, I'm going to uh, go to the University of Chicago and, uh, because my husband has a job there. And I love Stanford. It's a great place, but you know, we don't want to commute. And Jeff said to me, I don't know if you remember this. He said to me, I tell all my students this, so welcome to my classroom. <laughs> he said, you know, Linda, it's a lot easier to find a good man than a good job. <laughs> Now, hold on, hold those applause, hold those applause. And I said, well, Jeff, you have clearly never had to find a good man. <laughs> because you are so wrong. Good jobs are a dime a dozen. And so maybe that's my answer to you about what I've learned. I've learned that we have to keep our values and our priorities right in front of us, that we have to have our own definitions of what we believe is right or, or important and that we have to be careful that we don't default on what society or other people tell us is more important, notwithstanding Jeff Effer's very uh, not so great advice, but, but well intended, well intended. And I guess that that's what I would say is my succinct answer. It's very easy to go off your, to go off of your mission, um, to be distracted by all sorts of shiny objects and, and accoutrements of success and, and you know, we're smart people, capable, and we can be successful. We can do what other people want us to do. It's not hard. <laughs> you just put one foot in front of the other, you just keep doing it. But to stop and think and to think what's important to you and to have the strength and the courage to stay on that path, I think that's what I've learned. I think that's what I've learned. And it's as abstract an answer as it was a question. Well, then we're going to give you a more pointed question to, okay. to, get, to get a more pointed answer. Um, <clears throat> you have um, Kids in Danger, um, and you and Boaz and, and your executive director of Kids in Danger have actually influenced laws. Um, some of those laws, I'm sure, were opposed by <laughs> various economic interests. What have you learned about actually a building power to get to get those laws to protect children and to and, and make recalls more effective? Well, you need uh, timing is everything. This is what I've learned. Timing is everything. Um, so Danny, my son, died in a crib that had been recalled um, years earlier. But there's no requirement that I mean, uh, no one knew. Um, the daycare center where he died had been inspected eight days before his death, including the crib in which he died was inspected. But it had a design flaw. It didn't look dangerous. It didn't look deadly. It looked, as they say, uh, stir strong, sturdy, and well-constructed. So, you know, um, this is how he died. Now I just lost my train of thought. What is your question? <laughs> My question. Change the law. No, oh, my, changing my, my laws. Okay, is, okay. Did, did, no, did I'm on my way there. I'm on my way there. Okay. So, so at the time in the city of Chicago in Lincoln Park, there's no law uh, that children's products have to be, you know, that you have to check. Hi, George. How are you? Oh my gosh! I'm so happy to see you. This is George Parker. Hey, answer the question. Okay. Um, <laughs> So um, we started with laws about, um, uh, I thought, how can my son die in the city of Chicago, you know, in Lincoln Park, in a, in a daycare that's DCFS, I mean, licensed? So we started with local laws and uh, city laws, and then I wrote a state law. And uh, it wasn't, it's kind of hard to, it's not that it's hard to oppose this law, but um, 
I had a lot of support and help lobbying, and I learned Lobbying 101 from Nancy Cole, the director of uh, Kids in Danger. And we just did a lot of advanced footwork. Uh, you know, she would hand me papers and she'd say, go talk to this lawmaker, tell this person this, do this. And we just set the foundation. It was unanimous in the state house in Illinois. One person voted against our federal law. Um, Ron Paul, because he doesn't vote for laws, um, but he it was believe in regulation. yeah, yeah, and it was unanimous, and Bush signed it. Uh, I don't think he had. I don't think he could. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah. So, so thank you. So this is a law that protects your children. Um, part of it is the Danny Kesar uh, Product Safety Act, my son, and um, we did. We just did the the groundwork, and we fought a lot of good fights. I mean, I remember fighting with the head of the Illinois Retail Merchants Association um, and you know last minute changes and all sorts of things. And so I just had to get in there and, and do it, do what was necessary. I, I don't know. You just do what you have to do. Yep. OK, that's, that's a good answer. And I would ask you the same question, because you, of course, are known for your work on banking and finance reform. Um, and you're known for have picking fights with the famous Jamie Dimon, um, who actually was in my who actually was in my class the year I visited Harvard Business School a thousand years ago, um, and 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 you also have tried to push for changes in regulation and for changes in 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 how banks operate and how financial institutions operate, which has not always again been embraced. So first of all, I want to say that you know my first policy work was about was about Linda's work. I was here, and you know I would help do the same. It's state by state because this is commerce, uh, and so can you sell a, a recalled product in a secondhand store? Uh, do they have to inform daycare centers of uh, of uh, recalled products? It doesn't take very much. So. Financial impact is small, but you know you'd have to find a policymaker in California. We, you know, my friend and I wrote to Jackie Spear at the time she was a California a lawmaker, I believe, and and tried to get her to sponsor a bill and all of that. Because and the law was already written in Illinois, so you just you had to go state by state. So and that was kind of on the side. It wasn't down my professional. Uh, you know, work here at Stanford. I was teaching finance corporate finance, standard corporate finance. We would teach, you know, NPV, capital structure, all this stuff. And my path was, so Linda remained my friend. Uh, I write my checks to kids in danger every year, and I get mad that they have to exist. That's what makes me mad. Uh, why is it that the nonprofit has to advocate for something so obvious as to you know, have pre-testing of products so that you don't—they don't have millions of cribs in there that are Russian roulettes around the country. And why uh, is it that if you find out that they turn out to be dangerous, you're not more effective in making the corporations find them because they don't find them? They're not supposed to take up ads that their product is defective. They can p take up ads to, to sell the products only. You know, so they choose what to speak about. But if their products turn out to be dangerous, we don't have a law that makes sure they do put in ads and find them and chase the people. Which parent has time to go check the, the, the website? Now you can sign up to Kids in Danger and they'll send you, a, 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 you know, the information about recalled products, which is important. So I give it to parents of young children and say make sure to sign up for this email list and open up the email that tells you what's been recalled and check that you don't have it. So they started with an email list. People were sending it to their distribution, violating you know, organizations' uh, charts to tell their colleagues to find these cribs if they had them, because the company wasn't doing it and the government was not doing it. So those kinds of things. Anyway, so that was kind of on the sideline in honor of Danny Kassar, Kassar her son. The later fights came out of the financial crisis when I just saw that I lived in a bubble of wrong assumptions. And that what I thought was obvious was not only not obvious, but a lot of people were lying about it with straight face. The Jamie Diamond today is making disingenuous and confusing and misleading arguments as of today uh, and his lobbying organizations. But getting that straight, you know, giving truth more power, that's difficult. 
is what I learned. I learned that it's tough if powerful people don't want to hear you. And uh, it's a really unpleasant, Sisyphic fight. Uh, you know, that Blinda and I can exchange stories about what it's like uh, if you're up against power. And uh, you just have to dust yourself off uh, and uh, keep going. It's basically because you just feel like it's the right thing to do. And they shouldn't get away with what they're doing because society needs better. Have you tried to change actual laws and regulations? Oh, all the time. I mean, I've been in this battle for, for at least 13 years, 14 years. Yes, in every way I could. So that means, first of all, trying to talk to the policymakers themselves, trying to talk to the Congress people, trying to talk to the regulators, trying to submit comments, then writing a book for the public uh, because they don't want to hear you. They don't want to hear. What they don't want to hear, if you have a, a, a symbiotic relations between a sector and the government, you're in trouble. And that's definitely true in banking, that's for sure. Uh, that sector um, overwhelms the entire democracy. And that's how I became a democracy advocate, actually. And we have some people here who are fighting for democracy who we just met called Leadership Now Project. Check it out. Um, and uh, democracy and justice and equality is the work of all of us. So, um, you know, people can put their head in the sand or pursue power for, their, for power. But, you know, this session is called uh, Choosing Paths to Power for Good, but I focus on the good, which doesn't always mean power. You need power to change things, but, uh, you know, I don't stop at power. And if I have to give up power, uh, I'll do what I can. So Linda described, I think, how she went, you know, step by step and state by state mm -hmm. and legislator by legislator mm -hmm. and with your very, very powerful story. And I remember reading, there was a profile in the Chicago Tribune yeah. mag magazine. Chicago Magazine. Yeah. The Chicago Magazine, which was, quite, which was quite powerful. Have you also tried to have a narrative? I have. <laughs> they had a profile of me. I was Time 100, most influential but not most powerful person. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, the profile in the New York Times tried to get people to read it by saying when she speaks, banks shudder, which is false. Uh, and, you know, uh, I, I tried what I can. You just have to, you know, uh, see, you know, I, I gave up on it, basically, because there was nothing more I could do or say. I just ra wrapped up my effort in 2015-16 saying uh, it takes a village to maintain a system, a lot of enablers. Every time you see something wrong, uh, there, are many, uh, there are often many enablers of it, it, how it happened. Well, you know, they either uh, support it or they just don't challenge it because it's not convenient. So uh, I saw the enablers, including academics, and um, it is what it is in that case. It's very difficult. So. Um, you know, you try to prod, you just stay your course. And, uh, you know, I, I accomplished things. People tell me I made a difference. Uh, you know, it's not enough for me, but, uh, but it's not enough for Linda. Linda and I had a conversation precisely about this. In fact, in preparation for this or just brainstorming titles for this event. And, it, you know, it's like, oh, can you, can you maintain kids in danger? Can you maintain a scrappy nonprofit like that that doesn't take money from the industry? Um, can you do that? and still advocate. Kids in Danger is like the scrappiest of organizations. It has one director, which is, you know, before, without whom it couldn't survive, and, um, and a bunch of friends of Linda giving it money. And, I have very good friends, very loyal, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and um, so I get the fundraising, today's Giving Tuesday. Uh, I'm twice on the, mail on the mailing list, I complain to Linda. And uh, so it was in my email this morning. And um, so and she said, no, but you know, even if I closed down Kids in Danger, we made a difference. That's what she told me. And that's a good perspective. Look at the bright side. You made a difference. Uh, and that's all we can do. So you earlier this morning um, showed me the I think Safe Kids, Kids Safe? Safe Kids. Safe Kids. Talk about what industry has done to try to co-opt and sidetrack side your efforts. Yeah. I don't know they did it against us to sidetrack our efforts, but uh, Jeff was saying that there are just so many nonprofits doing too much, that everybody, everybody's got a nonprofit and they're all overlapping. And, and, you know, when we started Kids in Danger, we thought, 
all we have to do is tell people what happened. I mean, how does a son of two University of Chicago professors die in a licensed daycare home in Lincoln Park, Chicago, in a crib that's recalled and killed 11 children before him? Like, in what universe does that happen? You know, we thought, we just have to tell people about this and that we're working to fight this. And, you know, we're just going to have no trouble fundraising. Huh. There are so many good causes out there, right? And so, um, so Safe Kids, so, the, so I was telling, Anat was saying, telling Jeff, uh, Kids in Danger is the only organization of its kind that's working on children's product safety. And he said, no, no, no. And I said, well, there is one other. It's called Safe Kids, but it's basically run by the industry. It's funded by industry, and it has a completely different focus. Our focus is on getting manufacturers to design safety into their products instead of using recalls as a Band-Aid after they've put their products on the markets, instead of using our children as test subjects in our homes, um, we're trying to get manufacturers to take more responsibility for their own growth. By the way, in choosing leadership, I'm trying to get you to take more responsibility for your own growth. So there's a theme in my life here. Um, you, everyone, people. Um, so. So we're trying to get manufacturers to take more responsibility for their own growth. It's very, for their own growth, <laughs> yeah, please grow in a good way. Manufacturers responsible for their products. And um, Safe Kids takes a lot of money, take, is funded highly, has a lot of money from industry. And their message is basically about parental supervision. Yeah, it's supervision, it's about parental, and I'm all for parental supervision, but as a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Uh, Bob Tan says, you know, you don't have eyes in the back of your head. So you can be in the same room with your kid, you don't have eyes in the back of your head. And uh, the, parent, Ikea, uh, yeah, the, 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 the Ikea dresser, when you open the door, and the kids step in them and then millions of dressers yeah. that would topple on a kid. Uh, parents and were in parents the room. Parents who lost kids to lobby for this one. Yeah. So, so um, I have a theme here is that I'm losing my train of thought. Yeah. So Safe Kids is basically Thank has you. an implicit <laughs> message that it's a parent's fault. Whatever right. It's happens. about so supervision. They would never think about suing the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. They would never think about changing the law. They would just eat their, you know, grieve for their son, and that's it, and blame themselves. For what happened. Well, you always they blame yourself because you are a parent you and you are responsible for your anyway, child. Anyway, but you wouldn't think there are other people that could have prevented it, that should have prevented it. And, that, and by this, they save themselves paying you tort uh, compensation and having to do anything to keep there because the cost of doing yeah. business is occasionally somebody will think of suing you, and that's it. If well, there's a recall, you know, you just wait the product out. One of the ways that power is exercised is through the use of language. And I love your comment earlier this morning about accident. Oh, yeah. The, oh, word, yeah. A, the yeah. word accident. And you used accident in your introduction. I was surprised. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, the people were saying, oh, it's an accident. It's just an accident. You know, what can you do about an accident? I mean, when we found out that our son was killed, we thought, oh, my God, how does a crib collapse and strangle a child? I mean, how does that even happen? That must be like a one in a million kind of freaky, freak accident, right? And um, But no, <laughs> we found out it's not a freak accident. And it's an incident. It's not an accident. You know, um, accidents are preventable. This is, pre this is preventable. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's knowledge. It's information. And um, you know, by saying something's just an accident, it's like, oh well, nothing we can do about it. It's a random active event. Nature. Yeah, it's an act of nature. It's an act of God, whatever. So we try not to use the word accident. And our friend Marla Felcher, who wrote a book called "It's No Accident," kind of in her title tried to fight this. But you know, there's a book now called it, "There Are No Accidents," <laughs> and it basically says exactly this: everything you would call an accident, look a little beyond that and realize all the things that contributed to this thing happening. And it's, it's, it's a little bit like the financial crisis too, because financial crisis narratives were, you know, 100 year flood, never see it coming, all of that. And that was wrong and convenient for the people. Uh, and now it's like, oh, SVB was just a run suddenly on social media, not a sudden run, you know, a reckless bank. And, and that became insolvent, that's all, you know, and supervisors let it happen. It was completely preventable. 
I wanted to say something about language because this goes back to my roots, my early roots. I, I call this my homecoming event because um, you know my first job was at Stanford with these lovely people and my neighbor across the hall from me, one of the first person people I ever spoke to, and I just used to open my prop my door open, hoping George Parker would walk by and <laughs> pop his head in and say hello to me. And um, so uh, Jeff told me when I was, you know, I came from experimental social psychology. So I, I'm one of the first PhDs, and I'm the first PhD in Princeton to take a job in a business school. And I did so because I really wanted to make knowledge useful. I wanted to work with people who are going to put the knowledge, which I think social psychology is the most important discipline for executives. And if you don't believe me, talk to the economists. Because what is behavioral economics? It's social psychology done by economists. And good for them. Good for them that they figured out that social psychology is the most important discipline. Good for them. Good for them. That's, they're very smart. So, so when I first started here, I didn't know that much, you know, business school, what, I, and Jeff came by and he told me, you know, Linda, your job is to man help our students manage meaning. And I thought, manage meaning? What does that even mean, manage meaning? So I'm slow but good. It's taken me many, many years. And Jeff just said it, the language you use. We manage meaning through the words we use, through the connotations, through what it implies. We manage meaning through the symbols that we use, to what we make salient, to what we draw people's attention to. You are managing meaning all the time, and people are managing it around you. And so to understand that, I think, is, is one of the paths to power. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> the management of meaning, symbols, this kind of thing. So I love that he asked this question about language. And you, know, you can think about incident versus accident. You can think about um, uh, leader, the term leader, and what does that bring up versus manager or versus executive? All the stereotypes that come around when you use a certain word. And that that can be manipulated. That can be managed. And manipulation, is it good or bad? It depends, <laughs> right? Depends. Yeah, it depends. So the question is, to what end do you put your, your knowledge, to you put your energy? And I think that that's part of why we're here today, thinking about you know, what does it mean to, for good? You have to decide what it means to you. No one can decide that for you. I mean, you can, yeah, you can let people decide it for you, but that's, that's basically a cop-out. So one of the questions that was raised by many of the students is the is two kind of dilemmas that I think many people struggle with when they use when they hear the word power. Uh, one is the issue of ends and means. Um, you know, so can you? What, the, what what do you want to do, and how far are you willing to go um, to uh, uh, to uh, to achieve a good goal? I think that's one thing. And then the second aspect, which I want both of you to comment on is this issue, some people believe, apparently, um, not too many people who take my class, but some people apparently believe that, that it is wrong to seek power, that it is, it's somehow immoral uh, mm -hmm. to be interested in seeking power for good or for, for evil. Mm -hmm. So how would you both respond to, this, to, to, the, two, to the two dilemmas? Well, the, the, the dilemma about ends and means and the dilemma about power. OK, I'll try to be succinct. I saw the questions that the students had submitted through Renata, and I wanted to say thank you so much for all your good work on this. It was really amazing, Renata. Thank you. Um, and one of the questions was, uh, you know, like, who are we to seek power? And I thought, what an interesting question. If not you, who? Yeah, if not you, who? <coughs> who, who should seek power if not you? What does it mean, who are we to seek power? What do you think power is? And what are you going to do with it? So I think it's more a question of thinking about um, what, what your identity is. This is my answer to this question. So for example, means justify the ends. This comes up from one of the questions is something like, I think this is where you, you can. When is it all right to compromise your values to achieve power, realizing you may be able to do more in a place of higher power? When is it right? Well, I don't think it's right to compromise your values. Your values? Values are supposed to be what gives you structural integrity, what helps you to stand strong, what helps you to be buff, you know, to resist the, the wind, the gale force winds. If you compromise your value in this moment in order to do something good in the future, by the time you get to that future, you're not going to be the same person because your identity is going to follow your behaviors. And we were talking about this also, you know, you go to an organization, you look at who's at the top. 
Do you want to be like them? If you don't want to be like them, you should leave that situation because that's what success looks like in this organization. And if you stay, you're going to be successful. You're going to become like them. So I think it's a question of identity. Who are you? Who do you want to be? And realize that every choice you make leads you in that direction. That's my answer. So uh, I also circled, you know, who are we to take power? And it's a great question. It's a really great that somebody would reflect on that. Why should I have power? Why, why should the power not be evenly distributed in the economy? Why should some people, you know, take Jeff's class and know how the, and get a path to power? Uh, and I did read Jeff's book in preparation for this event, I realizing I, you know, I wasn't doing everything to get power for power's sake because of the dilemmas of, uh, of, uh, of having to come up against people uh, who have different, uh, different things they want with their power than what I want to do. And I want to have power, so it's like I do want path to power, but I, only if I can use it, um, you know, not ahead of, of, uh, of the, or the for good part of it. So, um, so I do think power, we, are, we have to be agnostic to power. Uh, we just have to uh, make sure people who have it don't abuse it. And ideally, not to abuse it ourselves, but use it for good. That's a good question. That's a good answer. Thank um, you. <laughs> I get a good grade. <laughs> gold gold you star. Good, you're gonna, Even you're if gonna I don't grade. follow every direction. For okay. power, which is, you know, first of all, to flatter and then to be careful of people who flatter you once you get to power. <laughs> <laughs> with the people who follow the earlier advice. <laughs> there you go. So I would want to end with a couple of other things. Um, you've already alluded to it. Today is Giving Tuesday, which is started actually by my friend Henry Timms, who now runs Lincoln Center. Um, there is, I don't know if, if people in this room not understand this, but there are as many nonprofit organizations started per year as there are for profit organizations. So there's, in fact, a proliferation. One of the, I, uh, I knew the guy who ran Project Open Hand. By the way, if I were uh, going to figure out how to change society, I would begin by studying the AIDS activists act up. I think the, I think the AIDS, uh, the, the, the gay men in San Francisco can teach us a lot about how to get things done. Um, and the, we've, I think, forgotten those lessons or lost them. But at any event, um, I knew the guy um, who ran Project Open Hand, which feeds the homeless, as it began by feeding uh, shut-in uh, uh, men with AIDS, but it now, now feeds the homeless in San Francisco. And we talked about the 40 organizations feeding the homeless in San Francisco. There's almost no mergers among nonprofits. Um, and so there is, in fact, a proliferation of nonprofits. It's interesting to, that had, you are the only. We had you, a merger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but, there, but there are many. Mm -hmm. There are many. So there's a proliferation. And so the question is, how do you prioritize efforts in a world in which, in a world in which, to take your example, you know, it's, uh, uh, children are killed by uh, defective toys and defective children's furniture. Children are also killed mm -hmm. by guns. Mm -hmm. And you, I know, thought about, in Kids in Danger, doing something about guns. Yeah. So how, how, do, how does one prioritize one's efforts? So I think it's really interesting. It's called mission <laughs> and focus. And we had a lot of discussions in our board about, is Kids in Danger going to be more like a Sierra group you know, or an ACT UP? Like, are we going to be more, more mean and feisty and in your face, or are we going to play nice? Um, are we going to, uh, what's our focus going to be? So for example, we decided our focus needed to be durable children's products. So children are injured, I mean, swimming pools, blinds, all different kinds of things, right? But we can't do everything. So we decided durable children's products, which mostly mean nursery projects, products. Now there's a light side and a dark side to every decision that you make. And this is very narrow. And um, parents and caregivers grow out of this you know, nursery product. You, you outgrow it, and then you're done. You're not involved in this, this real mission. Then you come back to it when you're a grandparent or something like that. But we actually considered. Um, uh, taking on gun, gun violence and, and gun control. And we decided that we do not have the resources to fight that fight. And that uh, someone else would be better off fighting that fight than our little scrappy uh, kids in danger. Um, and, uh, so I, and then who do you give money to? Well, who do you want to support? 
I mean, there are just a lot of causes out there. And you have to prioritize. And this is another, sorry, like I said, this is my homecoming. Uh, actually, Jeff's in the book. His advice is in the book. Uh, it's under the best advice I ever received. And um, uh, the, the advice was, beware of once in a lifetime opportunities that come along every day. And I took that to mean that I have to make my own priorities. And I agree with that. Beware of once in a lifetime opportunities that come along every day. You have to think, you have to make your priorities. And so there are, once a, there are all sorts of things that you could contribute money to, contribute your heart, your talent, your energy. And you have to decide. And that's a choice. And whatever you choose, it's going to affect who you become and the future that you create. But you should do it with presence or with um, you know, deliberate, deliberation as opposed to by default and as opposed to by what people around you think you should do. And it's easier to just put one foot in front of the other and do what everyone else is doing. But then one day you might stop and look back and say, Who, why did I do that? How, how did I end up here? And you can avoid that fate by starting now asking the questions about what's important to you and who do you want to be. And I believe that is the path to power for good. Well, that's why choosing was kind of the first. It's in her book, and it's the first word for this event. And then, you know, mixing up the good, the words, you know, power, good, choosing, you know, put them in a path. path. And path, that was from his course. That's right. And <laughs> the course titled Path 2. So Path to X for good. And originally, Linda and I thought of Path for Advocacy for good, because advocacy is also lobbying. That's advocacy. <laughs> Did you, did you consider starting a nonprofit independent of Stanford? I did. I did. Talk about that. Well, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't think about it seriously because I knew I would have trouble raising money. So, uh, you know, and, and so right now, I mean, I still work within the university, but it's an, an actual issue because when you belong to a very bureaucratic organization and you have a cause and you depend on the people above you in the organization to, uh, to like your cause, well, uh, you know, um, I'm not going to talk about you know GSB politics here, but uh, but the, every organization has politics, so oh. I'll stop you. Well, this, this, <laughs> I'm not going to let you off the hook. <laughs> every every organization has donors. No, I you know I no. Every organization has donors, you. and some of the donors probably are not happy of the, That's about right. the bankers' new. Quotas. That's right. No, no, no. I can tell you the following. The, there are organizations, not nonprofit that actually thought if they gave money to the business school, I would stop writing an op-ed. They actually seriously said that to a colleague of mine. It's pretty shocking uh, that they thought that uh, by giving money to Stanford Business School, they would, uh, Stanford Business School would tell me not to write uh, an op-ed or not to opine on policy. It's pretty dismaying. So I had all kinds of little experiences like that along the way. Now, in terms of nonprofits, I mean, I, I, you know, starting a nonprofit in the world in which there are so many, I mean, I thought more, what is the mission? And at some point, uh, you know, just to give you an example, I evolved into thinking about corruption and anti-corruption organizations. And so I started looking into anti-corruption organizations. There's human rights organizations, there are, you know, all kinds of organizations out there that are kind of, you know, in the vicinity. Of, of just trying to get trustworthy institutions, trust democracies, all of that. So I looked, for example, at Transparency International. Transparency International is, and now I, you know, I'm, and I'm about to invite to Stanford uh, the founder of Global Witness. And I went to an anti-corruption conference where I met him. That's a very gutsy organization. I'm bringing you know, Jesse Isinger, that's nonprofit media, uh, investigative reporting, ProPublica, Pro -publica, yeah. And, uh, but in Transparency International, just to give you an idea of how, how bad it can get, I discovered a few years ago that Transparency International has chapters in different countries. And the chapter in a country is supposed to deal with corruption issues in their countries. Well, it turned, I was wondering why is there no TI uh, Transparency International US? It turned out that there was a Transparency International US for a while, but that organization, Transparency International, TI, based in Berlin, uh, actually audits the organizations uh, that are the chapters. And uh, there's the chapters are supposed to do what the chapters are, are, are you know, meant to do. And they discovered that the US chapter of uh, Transparency International was doing corruption everywhere but the US. Uh, because corruption always happened elsewhere. 
Where happens here? And they closed it. They actually dis they disallowed this uh, chapter of Transparency International for a few years. There was no chapter. It got started again about uh, a couple of years ago. But this was, uh, I, I, didn't, I wasn't aware of it. I met the head of Transparency International in a conference, an anti-corruption conference of IMF. And uh, I immediately said to her, why is there no, I mean, and I literally thought, I will start a, non -cha a chapter of TI. I'll just leave Stanford and I'll start a chapter of Transparency International in the US. And uh, to talk about subtle legal forms of corruption in this country. And, um, and so I then discovered the story. I asked her, and she said, you know, we had an organization, but it, we closed it because it wasn't doing, it was a, a front to some corporate, you know, boondoggles and donations, and it, it was corrupt itself. So uh, how can a Transparency International become corrupt anywhere? You know, they have to worry about it. So uh, anyway, um, so I, I communicated with them for a while. I mean, it didn't end up happening. They ended up taking somebody else uh, and actually restarting it. Uh, it took them a little while to band with other anti-corruption, uh, you know, open secrets or crew or other uh, US organizations that do, uh, you know, keep track of money in politics and do all of this other stuff. And, and so, and in fact, that's, that's who introduced me to some people in, uh, in that anti-corruption conference last year, which also brought to Cassie, uh, an HBS 1960 graduate, 1960, he was 87 years old when he came here, and I met him there, and he said to me, I'm the only MBA student in this conference. And I said, well, I bet you I'm the only business school faculty in this conference. It was the international conference on, on anti-corruption, and the first time ever in the US. And it happened here in December in, D in DC, but like four or five days events. And you know, if you walk around the corridors, there's tons of people there, but you wouldn't find people working on corruption in developed countries. And so I asked the people, like the TI, the transparency guy from the US and other people, a couple of people that I knew there to introduce me to the right crowd. And I was introduced to this person. He wrote a book called uh, Invisible Trillions. And he asked me, so do you think business schools are interested in, in secrecy, capitalism, and how it destroys democracy? And I said, well, I don't know about business schools, but Cassie is. And we brought him here to before he gets even older in the spring to speak with Larry Diamond, who wrote the preface to his book from uh, right here in the Center for Democracy and the Rule of Law, Development, Democracy, and the Rule of Law. Um, which doesn't pay attention to capitalism and democracy. And that's really what, what we want to do uh, here. Well, th we have about 16 or 17 yeah. minutes left. We'll turn it over to questions from the audience, of which we have like lots, lots of, of questions and lots of audience. Yes, sir. I want to return to something that you said, Dr. Ginzel, about this idea of like if you look at the top of an organization and you see a version of success that you don't like, then you should leave that organization. And I guess my worry is that in certain industries, in certain fields, in certain organizations, if good people always take that route and just choose to leave, that you'll never have good people like rise to the top and redefine success. How would you reconcile those two things? There are a lot of organizations and a lot of industries. And I think that we fit is the most important thing. And um, we were talking about Charles O'Reilly and his article about social control in organizations and old. I, he's, old a, he's there also. Oh. Charles. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I didn't recognize you. See? I saw George. And so this is. This is. <laughs> I'm so well happy to see you. Well, so this man here, okay, um, one of the articles I still teach. I love it, the, the, this article, it's a California Management Review article, I believe, about, um, so what he talks about is the fact that when you come into an organization, right, you, um, you start and it's compliance. You do what you do because you're getting paid, you know, da, da, da. And then you either leave, if it doesn't work, or you stay and you start to identify, you start to see your boss and you think, oh, that's what, you, know, you it's called referent power in psychology, right? So you refer to that person, you act like them, you might dress like them even, you, you try to behave like them, that's what, you, you know, that's who you're referring to. And then at some point you internalize the values of the organization, you don't need the role model anymore because now you're committed, you have a commitment to that organization or that, those values. And you don't need to have a role model show you how to behave or, or what to do. So at any point, you can take off, you know, get out of this cycle. And I will tell you, if you stay in an organization where you do not fit, one of three, three well, you'll either leave, or they will change you, or you will be very miserable before until you leave. 
Oh, they won't fire you. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, that's part of being miserable. <laughs> um, so that is. So I think, and I hope. What's your name? Ryan. Ryan and I. One I, of Cassie's leaders. Yay, Ryan! Uh, I I hope for your for your future self that you will choose wisely and fit where you can put your energy to good use, where you won't be spinning in place and using all your a lot of your good energy in order to try to fight a system that doesn't deserve your energies and that you will put those those energies in a cho in a place where you can do more good because life is hard enough and you can't solve everything and so you need to choose wisely pick your battles mm. where you can be successful and that's my hope for you and my i think Linda's answer comes from the fundamental social psychological idea that environments matter a lot. That, that environments affect how we think and our attitudes and, our, and, and almost all decisions we make are socially influenced. And so her answer comes from a place of choose your environment. You know, so if you, if you, if you want to be a certain kind of person, choose an environment in which you're going to be surrounded by those kind of people who are going to encourage you to do things that you want to, want to do rather than to be in a system where you think I'm going to somehow be separate from and not be influenced by the environment. So I saw another yes, sir. Yes. Uh Great, uh, excellent. Thank you for um, presenting. And um, again, call out to all who are with uh, pro democracy organizations. Um, giving a plug also for not just leadership now, but also the Lincoln Project. Uh, do lump up. Very valuable for their podcast. If you enjoy those. So now to uh, Linda, your mention about your role with nonprofits and having to prioritize because, of course, you can't focus on everything. Since uh, myself, I sit on the board of a couple of uh, nonprofits and. Actually, for me, the last uh, 15 years myself, it's been figuring out where can, it's over the course of not just academia, but co-founding startup after startup, mostly social enterprises, just figure out so where can I mm -hmm. put my efforts to do the most good. Right. So something that's recently, just the last couple of years, has emerged, and it's something I've heard talked about by uh, many like uh, Cameron Sinclair of Architecture Humanity. He even ch made a challenge. It was on the floor at the UN that is there any donor willing to give a condition that say, here are three or many more nonprofits mm -hmm. going for the same pool of funds? Mm -hmm. And if any donor is willing to make this condition that, well, you all get your funds if you decide to collaborate jointly on this as opposed to try to compete against each other for that limited, that scarcity mindset, as you say. Mm -hmm. So just any uh, perspectives on your experience, not just you, Linda, but also Jeffrey and uh, Anat, and since you know Henry Timms, I've known him for a decade ago as well with the uh, UN Foundation, that how receptive have those in nonprofits been, given I've heard it talked about a lot, but unfortunately not much action on that front, in collaborative grant making, that you actually work if you have a much bigger issue than one organization could handle, actually working with the other organizations that are complementary to yours that you might not cover this area but rather just pursue it jointly okay. even as separate organizations so very briefly i will tell you that we are in a very small space and uh there was an organization uh when my son danny was killed actually in california here in the bay area and it was called the danny foundation same name same name and the kid died the same way but in a but in a a full-size crib in their home. And he tried to crawl out of the crib and his, his clothes got caught on a finial, the decorative tops of the crib, and strangled him and his mother found him before. Same failure mode. Excuse me? Same failure mode as... No, no, no. no, no, just, no. Just, that was a collapsible... Uh, no, the one that killed portable. my son strangled him through the rails of the crib, but this this boy strangled in a more traditional way is what I'm trying to say. Traditional home, he was, his mother was home. And so they started an organization called the Danny Foundation. And we flew out here to um, meet them and to talk with them. And when they closed, but see, here's the problem. Part of the problem is that different groups have different focus. So their focus was on getting safe cribs in California to California residents. They wanted safe cribs. That's where they put their money and their energy. But when they when they quit, when they folded, they gave us their funding and their their 
mission, you know, whatever, to kind of bring it broadly. So that was a merger, I was saying, is with the Danny Foundation out of Alamo, California. We do have a coalition of safety um, advocates. We work with the uh, um, CFA, and we Consumer work with Federation. PERG, yeah, Consumer Federation of America. We work with Public Interest Research Group. Um, so we do have coalitions where we get together. We do joint press conferences. We don't do joint fundraising. Um, they make they get a lot more money than we do because they're big national organizations. So it is very difficult to. Um, but I think if you're all working on the same issue, it makes sense. And if this guy's going to fund them, more power to him. I think you combine and go for it. There's strength in numbers, just like there is in people. When you're you know think about negotiation, you have a coalition. Well, there's strength in numbers. So get together and and uh, you know fight the good fight. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't know why it's so hard. Do you know why it's hard? He's yes, asking. I know exactly why it's tell, hard. Tell us. <laughs> People. No, it's hard, it's, hard, it's hard because I think um, many of these things are, you know, I don't want to use too provocative word. Many, many of these things are vanity projects. So I've done a lot of research recently on mental health, and I've run into people who are very interested in issues of mental health, and uh, for instance, suicide and, uh, and depression. And then when somebody comes to me and says to me, I'm interested in talking to you about your research on uh, depression or whatever, I always begin by asking them who in their family suffered. And, it's all, and, there's, almost, and there's almost always an answer to that question. That there, is a, that, there is a, that, that, that there is somebody in their family who had some severe uh, either depression or some other uh, behavioral challenge and they want to um, and they, and they want to do something That's about obvious. this. But why do you call it vanity? That could be That's passion. The, that could be. It comes from your but, own experience. But, and here's where it comes from vanity, they want the, the organization named and, and they want to be in control of the organization and they want to, they want to run the thing and they don't want to really come to, they will they will collaborate to some also, extent. Also, it's about control uh, more it, than. It, it is about control and it's often about the name. And it's hmm. often about the name, that they will name it after uh, the, the, the family member who has suffered. So, they, they, so if, they, if they want to optimize their effects on mental health or whatever their particular issue was, they would probably very much in the same way that if you went to optimize taking care of the homeless problem in San Francisco, you would not have 40 separate organizations trying to feed the homeless in San Francisco. 40 organizations which all have their own independent fundraising, which have their own independent administration. The duplication of administrative effort is extraordinarily inefficient. I'm not, by the way, the first human being who's ever figured this out. As a matter of fact, many people in the nonprofit world understand precisely what I'm talking about. And so, but, but, but everybody, they, they want their executive directors and they want their thing and their vision and their view of what needs to be done. So it, is, it comes back to why most people do most things. Three-letter word, ego. <laughs> if I understand human behavior, ego. Mm -hmm. It's a good place to start. Ego means self. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. I mean, if you, uh, if fast to power is powerful for you, then, you know, ego yeah. is your, yeah. your uh, focus. Yeah. And I'm it's true that a lot of people do focus on themselves. Yeah. So yeah, more questions. Yes, ma'am. In both of your examples, you talk about places in the private sector doing nonprofit work. But in both um, for kids and mental health, I could think of collaborations with government agencies or professional agencies, the American Academy of Pediatrics or National Institute for Mental Health. And I just wonder if um, there is a public-private partnership that could be improved um, that would perhaps, government is not known for reducing inefficiency and redundancy, but that would permit sort of a focus of mission. Um, and if you could speak to that, it, it does a um, sort of public private partnerships in some of these issues that touch many people's lives, the two that you, you know. I mean, I can say a few words about that. We, um, we have, um, the way that we have reached the um, American, uh, the American Pediatric 
uh, AP, what is it called? The pe you're a pediatrician, right? Um, the pediatricians is through a board member who is a, a pediatrician. And so we got into, um, we got the organization, the, your professional organization to work with us to get information into hospitals, to get information to new mothers, new, new parents uh, when their babies are, before they're released from the hospital. Uh, but it's very ad hoc and informal. I think that, you know, who, these organizations are very conservative. They don't, like, who am I? Like, who's Kids in Danger? Why are they gonna do a partnership with, with them? Like, what's, you know, what's their track record? What's their, you know, and why them and not someone else? So I think official partnerships are very difficult, but informally, we've been able to make partnerships through our board members and also government. I mean, you know, we are considered a watchdog, Kids in Danger is a watchdog for the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And um, and um, this is what I'm telling you, we had this discussion, long discussion about how much of a bulldog we were gonna be and how much we were gonna play nice. We decided to play nice because we thought that we could get further with that. And um, and I don't think we made a mistake, um, but it means that you have to build a long relationship and then commissioners change and then in administrations change. So it's very difficult to make these partnerships with government and with these big organizations um, because they take they take a long term commitment and, and a lot of things churn. That's my answer, based on my experience. Yeah. And they have, you know, I mean, all these organizations have, as organizations do, their own agendas and their own funding priorities, and they are trying to build their own, you know, their own brands and their own whatever. And so, and so the partnerships, I think, the public private partnership idea is an extraordinarily good one, but it's harder. It's, easy, it's easier to talk about than it is to pull off, as well, I suspect. It's, it's easier in the listen. small in small scale. So, for example, one of my advocacy experiences was in, just in Palo Alto around, uh, you know, suicide prevention, and because there was a spate of suicides some years back, and it was an effort of you know the the clinics and the municipality and parents who were guarding the train tracks and all kinds of efforts uh, there, and it was a coalition of, of organizations that one was the hospital and, and uh, you know, in the medical profession as well as in the schools and a lot of advocacy going on. Another. Um, Dr. Gazelle, I'm quite interested in questioning your uh, stance that the only way to kind of make that impact is you can't kind of go to, through the traditional paths to power in order to make a change at the top. And I think the reason why I question that... We're back to Ryan's question. Yes, a little bit, yeah. Um, and I you think didn't like my answer. <laughs> no, I think And even, not... even Professor Pfeffer tried to buttress my response <laughs> by giving it credibility and, and legitimacy, and you still have the question. It's very <laughs> interesting. No, that's fine. Um, I'm quite interested in human rights and supply chains. And I think I've tried to kind of approach that from multiple angles, and what I saw was... You can have good regulation, you can have good transparency organizations, nonprofits doing great work, but ultimately it was executives at organizations who continue to see issues in human rights in their supply chain, but would not address them because it wasn't competitive to do so. And I think when I think about that problem and how do you address it, how do you best address it, it felt like the only option left is to kind of go down that pathway of becoming an executive in those types of organizations or a serious investor in those organizations in order to kind of affect the type of change you want to see in the way that they operate. So, so let me have a clarification. I was understanding Ryan's question being that he, Ryan, would be in an organization where he didn't like the management, the top, but he would work to change it personally, Ryan, in that organization. Now you're saying that there's a political issue, a broader issue, and you need to get companies involved. And yes, whatever, I mean, and, but are you saying, what's your name? Amdash. Amdash, are you saying that you personally, given that you have this big, broad societal goal, would go work for a company that is not meeting that goal in order to change that particular company? And if you are saying that, my question is, do you really believe that's the best use of your energies if you have this big goal to, to focus all your energy on this one company? Now, the investor thing is different. I think that's a different, or, or you know, some sort of ad advocacy, governance advocacy and such. But I think that I would have you think very seriously about the use of your energy and your talent and your time, given what your goal is. I, I would only say one sentence here. The, you know, presented with this, you know, supply chain human rights issue, um, 
you know, it is a global issue because it's across borders. Um, and then, you know, international law is not, is not going to do it. It's going to have to be something like the European, uh, you know, supply chain accountability law. So you, you, need, you need laws and you need enforcement of those laws. Not every country can do its own law. But if it tells its corporations, like they now do in Europe, we'll see when they implement it, that you are responsible for supply chain, for human rights violations along the entire supply chain. You can't say, I didn't know that they were employing you know, slaves, in, children slaves in, in Africa. Then you know, you're going to pay a fine in this country, or you know, as we discussed earlier, your executive will go to jail or whatever. That's a matter. You know, then, uh, then all of a sudden, you'll see results. Oh, we didn't talk about that. Yeah. About criminal penalties for it's executives. It's time's up, so it's, we'll have to have another session, I think. <laughs> yeah, OK, we need to end on time, because I'm sure people have other things they need to do. I want to thank my two friends for being with us today. Thank you.